uh, later on. Um, the next uh, panellist to take the spotlight will be Dave uh, Gibbons, uh, who is just going to give us an overview uh, of, of the, the AVB uh, standards uh, so that we know what it is we're, we're, we're talking about when we, when we talk about compliance and interoperability. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so I think um, many of you probably already know what AVB is, and, and that might be the reason why you came to listen to this panel. In case you don't, <coughs> excuse me, it stands for Audio Video Bridging. And uh, the, you know, the, uh, the intent is to have an IEEE uh, underwritten standard that's a part of the Ethernet standard, and that we can all build upon that to make a networking standard that can solve problems in a number of different markets. And the, the principal problems we want to solve are replacing the jumble of different cables that are necessary to connect both audio and video signals between devices for professionals, uh, for consumers, and even in automotive applications with one solution, one solution that it's going to be easy for people to configure and that is going to uh, allow tremendous capabilities in terms of the number of, of signals and channels that we can pass between the devices and that it uh, is basically provides uh, what I think the professional audio industry has been looking for for quite some time and, and something that those other industries are looking for as well. And uh, you know that's really the, the key uh, to uh, audio video bridging. In terms of its kind of raw capabilities, it's a part of the Ethernet standard, so it is actually using Ethernet as, as the means to do the, the communication. And for audio purposes, it's delivering low latency under two milliseconds guaranteed latency, even if you take it through as many as seven hops through different bridges, so needing to go through a you know, pathway of device to device to device where each pathway could be up to 100 meters of uh, Cat5 cable in length, you'll still remain under two milliseconds uh, through those seven hops, and that's at 100 megabits of uh, connection speed. At gigabit connection speeds, which of course are extremely common these days, uh, it'll even be possible to improve on that. And that two milliseconds is a worst case. So in many applications, the devices, when they configure themselves, will settle on a latency that's even lower than that, and uh, sub-millisecond latencies will be entirely possible. Um, so that's important. It needs to deliver the, the audio in a low latency to work well for the kinds of applications that professional audio people are looking for. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, just as importantly, it will keep these streams precisely synchronized. And it does that by distributing a clock. So basically, in addition to moving the audio from place to place, it's moving a clock that allows video signals and audio signals to all be time aligned to playback. Uh, sample synchronously and also to play back at a specific presentation time. So even if they arrive at different devices by different paths and take different lengths of time to get there, all devices can be told to you know, hold until a specific time within that two millisecond window to play it back. And with very large distributed audio systems, that's obviously crucial. You need to make sure that the sound issuing from each of the speakers is time aligned to begin with so that any adjustments you make to the audio before you send it is, uh, is reflecting the time alignment that you're actually seeking to get. Um, Ethernet standards, of course, uh, uh, have often suffered from the, the fact that you're trying to get many different things over the network, and that's a key question for AVB. AVB will guarantee the bandwidth through the network, and it does that by basically uh, establishing a connection where it asks each device along the way to guarantee that it can deliver the type of connection it's looking for, the number of channels of audio or the video stream that it's looking to deliver to that point. And only after every device has sort of signed up to delivering that at a high and reliable quality is the connection established. And that's how you know when you make a connection between two devices that it's going to carry on taking the audio there without clicks or pops or jitters or drop frames or any of the other side effects that, that we won't be able to tolerate in the professional audio and video communities. And, uh, and it can do that uh, and, and in a way that uh, allows it to coexist with other traffic that might be traveling on the same network. So not all traffic on an Ethernet network needs to be AVB compliant. You'll want to pass other types of messages as well. And you can, and AVB will accommodate passing those in the gaps in between the guaranteed streams that it's, make, that it's made. And, and I think that's really key as well. Uh, because uh, over time we're all going to want to get to that network that can serve a number of different purposes and not be dedicated just for the purpose of AVB audio. If people have to lay separate networks to do AVB audio or AVB video on top of the network that they're going to lay to send data back and forth, then that will probably make it unworkable for some period of time for people. So the, the end goal there is it can coexist with other data while still giving you that guaranteed delivery and that guaranteed throughput. Um, so. Uh, how does it work? You know, obviously there's a couple of stages uh, for, for a, a signal to go through. 
devices need to be on the network and they need to be discovered on the network and a lot of the work that's going on in the Avenue Alliance is contributing to those, the creation of those standards that allows devices to publish their presence so that we don't ask users to run around all of their devices and type in an IP address that doesn't conflict with an IP address in any other device. Uh, we want users to have that easy configuration experience that comes from simply switching on the devices and being able to see from even one single control station that every device is present on the network, that everything has configured itself in a way that doesn't conflict with the other devices, and that allows them to address the connections on those devices using plain English names or plain language names of some kind. Uh, if we bring users back to the point where they have to deal with ports, IP addresses, any of the kind of network specific technical terminology, then I think it's likely to fail. So the, the key thrust there is to make sure that things can be discovered easily and that you can find the uh, types of streams that a device is able to send and receive and that you can make those connections between devices pretty easily as well. And part of making that connection, which will be invisible to users, but is a very key part, is that part where it ensures that the transmission bandwidth exists on the network and it won't allow the connection to be made unless it can guarantee that bandwidth. And then it traffic shapes the network from that point forward to make sure it can continue to do that and accommodate as many signals as we'll want to send. Apart from that, of course, people will expect failure monitoring. That's a natural uh, expectation, I think, with any network. People uh, expect to be able to see what the devices on the network are doing and whether they're still functioning the way they were originally configured. And once you've established that connection, it's pretty easy to do that uh, because you can accommodate non-AVB traffic. You can simply send status messages or uh, uh, allow devices to broadcast failures that they have across the network in, in easy ways. And then uh, that synchronization point that I mentioned earlier on allows the, uh, the, the standard will allow devices to queue up things to be presented at a very specific time so that will keep things uh, sample accurate across even large networks with lots of devices on them. So uh, uh, there are a few things it doesn't do and you know I think once you start talking about networks it's important to point out the things that you're not trying to do um, because networks can do, you know, computer networks today do so many different types of interaction that uh, people's expectations can, can run to all kinds of capabilities. Uh, the, the AVB standard is not trying to define every possible way that a device could be remote controlled over Ethernet. Devices can be remote controlled over Ethernet and it will be entirely possible for manufacturers to implement that, but we're not necessarily trying to formulate in the standard exactly how that will work. Uh, for a couple of reasons, you know, partly because sometimes it, it, it can be a very complex set of different capabilities uh, if you make that list of capabilities that every device has to have for compatibility very long, then you make it take longer for every device to have even basic compatibility, just being able to exchange streams, for example. And uh, partly because, you know, we see that there's a lot of room for innovation from the, for the manufacturers there to be able to add additional capabilities that might be specific their, to their devices. And that's not something that you want to necessarily standardize in. If we think of the example of MIDI, MIDI standardized a lot of basic things about how notes could get switched on and off on synthesizers and between instruments and then it left room for other innovations to happen and a lot of those innovations did happen and, and now a tremendous number of things are possible to control using MIDI but they didn't have to be defined in the MIDI standard so uh, a very similar approach is, is at work here and uh, it's you know it's important that um, uh, everyone understands that we we don't necessarily have to wait until 50 manufacturers agree on exactly what protocol should be used to control an equalizer before we can go forward with this. We can go forward with this even with as simple a, a protocol as uh, defining how we make connections and ensure that they're going to work between devices. And then, you know, the, the other uh, key point that it, uh, I just want to re-emphasize is uh, everybody is aligned within Avenue and I think within the, the wider AVB community around the need to ensure that you don't have to be a network expert in order to use devices that have this capability. Uh, if we do that, will probably end up failing because lots of users will go, it's just too complicated to get it working and I have an alternative which is to run a cable between a couple of devices and I can make that work reliably. Uh, so it's you know very much the focus of, of everyone uh, that I've interacted with to make sure that it's simple enough th that people feel like it's not just an alternative to running a cable, it's a better alternative because it's easier to get more capability from it. So uh, <coughs> the, I think the other question that often comes up uh, in these discussions is why will, it, why will this network format be different? Uh, those, those of us who've been in even pro audio for a while have seen several networks come and go, and each time, of course, people have felt like this might be the one that solves that interconnection problem and makes all the devices work well together. And there are a couple of reasons why AVB is different. I think you know one key one is it is based on Ethernet, and that's a very ubiquitous standard, and it's going to be a part of the Ethernet standard. 
So you know that means that we can end up we'll end up with a fairly stringent approach to the uh, inter into the compatibility and interoperability between devices, and uh, that's a good thing. If it, you know if it were a very proprietary design, it would be. Uh, more difficult, I think, to get the number of manufacturers to implement that, that we expect to have happen with AVB, and it would be more difficult to get the manufacturers of uh, other devices that are more general purpose for Ethernet, like Ethernet switches, to also comply. So I think that's key, that it isn't actually part of the Ethernet standard. Uh, the, the second important thing is it's designed with both audio and video in mind, and it is designed with a few different target markets in mind. So Pro Audio is the one that we're most interested in, of course. Uh, at this show, but it's also looking to address the pro video business and to do the audio and video needs of the consumer electronics industry as well as the automotive industry where people are increasingly looking to interconnect all of the uh, media devices and, and control devices within cars. And uh, the reason that's important to us in pro audio is because those other industries are very large and they can help drive the creation of all of the infrastructure, all of the silicon all of the IP that's necessary to uh, implement that stuff. And that means the pro audio industry doesn't have to carry that expense on its own. It doesn't have to wait for some manufacturer in pro audio to be brave enough to sink tens of millions of dollars into creating that IP because uh, the other industries will help drive the adoption and help solve those problems. And in fact, we're already seeing that, you know, the silicon vendors who make this, the parts that go into ethernet switches are already solving that problem because they see that opportunity across those different markets, they would be less willing or maybe even unwilling to solve it if they thought it was something that was specific to Pro Audio. So uh, that's very key because that means it will drive the cost of the components necessary for manufacturers like some of us to build devices down to the point where we can build it in without really having to raise the price of the, the device at all. It means that we'll, uh, we have the capacity for the first time to add this capability without having to go to customers and say, you can have our non-network capable product and it's this much, or you can have our network capable product and unfortunately it's 10 or 15 percent more expensive. And you know that obviously will slow adoption as well, but when it hits the price point where we're able to build it in without it really having any cost penalty at all, and, and it is hitting that price point, then uh, that's where it can really become ubiquitous and something that people get for free and then start to use and then start to see the value in and then starts to become really widespread. So, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm very excited about it for those reasons. I think those are reasons why it really can be different this time around. Um,